All right, class. Um, so in this lecture, we're going to go over a handful of tools that were used on the VMs, um, which I performed the same experiment that you all did in the um, lab exercise that was put together on Thursday last week. Um, so that was compromising uh, the Windows 7 VM with uh, Puppy Rat and then uh, making sure that Puppy Rat got installed on the system uh, for persistence in such a way so that when you reboot the VM, uh, the VM comes back up. <clears throat> and um, and then the back door uh, ends up connecting back to the, uh, the controller. So, you know, just like um, last week, um, if I look at the IP address on here, oh, well, I have to... Um, refresh the IP address on here, but uh, we can just do that really quick like this. So if you ever run into any case where it doesn't have an IP address, and a lot of times this will happen from resuming, what you'll do is you'll right click on the little two monitor icon here, um, you'll disconnect the adapter and then reconnect it, and usually that'll force the DHCP client to go and um, request another IP address. So now that we have that little um, item out of the way, you can see that um, the IP address of the attacker system is this one right here, this .104 IP address. So we use that to attack and then uh, get remote access to the Windows 7 machine. <clears throat> so um, uh, when we did that um, and we performed all the different actions on the Windows 7 VM uh, as the adversary, um, we left a large number of breadcrumbs on the machine because um, in a Windows machine, if you run programs, if you perform operations, if you perform actions, especially if you uh, make some administrative changes to the system, uh, such as changing the files that run at boot up, um, in addition to you know, running programs that open um, new network sockets and stuff like that, um, you're going to leave a number of uh, breadcrumbs behind and some evidence of, uh, of what happened. Um, you know, that is to say, unless you use a, a rootkit that attempts to hide that data from, um, you know, from a, you know, from a naive admin or something like that. So, what I put together, and this is based on, um, you know, the more in depth, um, material that was posted here. So hopefully, Everyone read the static analysis of compromised VM page and then even delved into some of the articles that were listed on here, like documenting, um, you know, registry keys and stuff like that, how to use the registry, um, kind of how the master file tables um, structured. So um, this documentation is here um, for you to get uh, an idea from multiple sources about the different data structures and organization of the NTFS file system. Um, not necessarily for you to read them all exhaustively, unless you want to, um, but just to get a general idea from multiple different places, um, you know, because like any documentation, they can be, um, you know, they can be clear in some aspects and vague in other aspects, so I like to have kind of multiple sources of information available for you to, uh, um, to get your info from. Uh, so in every single one of these, or maybe not every single one, but in a lot of them, I try to pair the concepts about the different data um, uh, sets, about the different data sets that are in Windows, um, with some tools that um, you can use to collect uh, copies of that information. And so you can see here, we talk about the MFT to CSV tool, um, Windows event logs using um, Windows event logs and forensic analysis and stuff like that and talk about uh, Sysmon in addition to the Windows event log here. Um, so in some cases, like in this case, the Windows event viewer, I think, is the name of the tool. Um, you can use some native, or I should say some prepackaged tools that come with Windows um, to pull the data out. In other cases, um, you need some additional um, tools, such as uh, these two for like browser capture. Um, system memory is another one. Um, as we are you know, where um, in order for your program to execute on the processor, uh, the program itself needs to be, um, you know, needs to be present in memory. Uh, so it needs to be available in, you know, system memory, not just on disk, in order for the um, CPU to execute it. <clears throat> in addition to that, it generally needs to be 
stored in memory somewhere in an unencrypted fashion in order for the CPU to uh, to properly handle it as well. So um, those are two key uh, constraints that most programs, including malware, need to operate under. Um, so uh, we use that as um, kind of caveats to our advantage here. So this is, you know, how to use this WinPmem tool um, to collect memory, um, and then also how to extract that out in a way that the volatility program, which you can read a lot of information about on the internet, or some of you who've read um, <clears throat> malware analysis or memory analysis books uh, may have seen a lot of information about volatility, but you can use that to analyze um, the physical memory file uh, from the you know from the system. Uh, so um, you know some alternate ways to collect memory as well, um, and then this Placeo tool, which is also very popular um, and common, it used to be called um, this uh, you know log to timeline. I'll just kind of bring it up here really quick. Um, so it used to be called this log to timeline tool, and then they moved it into this new Placeo tool. Um, so we won't really be using this one uh, much uh, during this lecture, um, but I put it on here. Um, as later in the class, we may end up using it. So um, this one's a good one to play with and try and familiarize yourself with. Um, maybe after you've mastered uh, some of the other concepts that will be talked about today. <clears throat> so we'll jump into the analysis exercise. And so this is supposed to be a more hands-on approach, um, or maybe a hands-on focused demonstration, if you will, of the concepts that were discussed in um, you know, in that previous uh, web page that I showed you. Uh, so in this case, um, what we're going to do, um, and, uh, and when I say what we're going to do, what I mean is uh, what I've already done, and will go with uh, with uh, go through with you today, is um, uh, these five things, right? So um, I performed the same attack that you all performed on Thursday. Um, I performed it earlier in the week, um, and then I've performed it a couple more times since then um, so that I could get some uh, a good amount of information uh, on the system from there. So um, I use the same WinPmem binary that um, that's documented to go and collect a copy of system RAM. Uh, what I did uh, in my case was I actually used um, this um, shared folder in order to um, you know, in order to get the information into and out of the VM. So I'll make sure that um, I try and uh, copy some documentation around um, using this um, shared folder um, approach to transferring data back and forth. Um, in Windows, it's relatively straightforward. In Linux, it requires running a command to connect the two up. Um, that said, uh, what I ended up doing was I... Um, you know, basically connected a folder on my host system uh, so that it was available on both of the VMs. Um, that gave me the ability to run a lot of these tools to do data collection on Windows um, and then um, put that into a directory that then I could run a number of analysis tools on Kali against. So, um, you know, WinPmem and, vol and uh, Volatility, um, that'll collect all the uh, memory from the system, and then volatility is very handy in that it has a, a large number of prefab modules uh, for doing memory analysis. And uh, what it'll do is it'll actually look for a large number of really commonly known data structures that Windows leaves in memory, and it'll analyze those and then give you a nice human-readable text output that documents the contents of them. So anything from, say, what you've saved on the clipboard in Windows to the, um, you know, password hashes uh, for any of the users of the system uh, to the system services that are running. Um, all those things are stored in memory, and Volatility knows how to scan all of memory to try and find them. Um, MFT to CSV, again, this um, pulls the file listing uh, from the hard drive. Um, we'll use a um, uh, command line set um, for the or command line argument for this that'll report the data in a uh, kind of linear timeline format or almost like a timeline of activity rather than it being a listing of files on the system it'll be a listing of the different activities that have happened on those files at least um, you know the most uh, 
the most recent occurrence of each one of um, the four different types of activity that can occur. Um, auto runs is kind of a, um, a meta tool almost, uh, one that works off of data um, that some of these other tools uh, will collect the raw data. Um, auto runs will actually analyze the raw data and then cherry pick a handful of things that um, are common ways to get a program to remain resident on the system. Uh, so for instance, um, it's looking for any malware that uh, configures itself so that it will run if you reboot the system or if you log out, log back in again, um, or even if you say, um, you know, shut down the system, go to another location and open it back up. Um, RegEdit and NetStat are both part of Windows, um, and those two tools respectively will um, dump the contents of the registry or allow you to navigate the contents of the registry, and then NetStat will um, show you information about um, the network connections that are currently active. <clears throat> so we kind of go through that stuff here. Um, I had the Internet Explorer browser history. That actually ends up being another data point that can be collected with, uh, with volatility, um, and that can be very helpful as well. Um, I know I went into some other browser collection tools. Um, you know, in this case, it's always good to err on the side of, um, you know, broad collection. So um, you don't need one tool for each one of these things. If you want to, you can put together a tool chain um, that you actually use as many tools to accomplish the same task in hopes that, say, you can, you know, uh, unify all of your data sets and then you can have a much, uh, much bigger collection um, uh, effort. So I also uploaded a zip file containing um, all the tools I'm going to talk about down here, plus a few others um, that are useful. Um, and I hosted this in, in a Google Drive link. So if you want to, you know, you can um, download it. So it'll go like this, and then it'll give you a list of all the stuff that's in there. Um, so, you know, uh, that's available for you. All right. So we'll jump into system memory analysis. So as I said, um, WinPmem uh, ends up being uh, the tool we use to capture a copy of memory. Um, it's important to know that it stores memory in this um, custom AFF4 format, um, which is actually just a very specially crafted um, zip64 file. Um, so basically that's a zip file that uses 64-bit addressing um, so that they can store large files within the zip file. Um, that's important to keep in mind because um, not all programs can actually read that format. Um, however, the unzip tool um, on Kali um, that comes with the version I gave you uh, is able to analyze that or is able to read that particular zip file format. Um, <clears throat> so this goes into how to pull the physical memory blob out of that file and then save it somewhere. Um, once it's saved somewhere, so um, once the physical memory file is saved somewhere, I can actually give it to Volatility. So um, as I said earlier, uh, Volatility has all of these different uh, modules associated with it. Uh, so um, what I've done is I've actually gone through all of the modules and I've pulled out a number of modules that run that have a, a reasonable runtime, um, so they won't have you... Um, you know, sitting still, I still wouldn't recommend like sitting at your computer and waiting for it to get through all of these things. Um, but I gave it a list of modules that um, both get a lot of data. And you can see there's maybe about, I don't know, um, maybe about 50 or 60 here. Um, they get a lot of data from the system and they also don't take a extremely long time to run. Um, so those are listed in here. And then I put together a very short um, basically shell script uh, that'll loop through each one of them and run every single one of the uh, modules from volatility. So that's referenced in this variable here. Um, output its content, so output whatever its results are into a file that's named module.txt, um, and they're all running against physical memory. I gave it this profile, um, <clears throat> which seems very specific, um, but um, you know, I'll just say that if I go to um, if I go to look at that physical memory again, um, there is a um, there's a module. And this is almost always the first module that you run. 
uh, if you're using volatility, called image info. <clears throat> and you'll see how long this takes and why, you know, it's going to take like five, six, maybe ten seconds. Um, this is why I don't want to run all these, um, you know, right in front of the lecture. We'd be sitting here being silent and waiting for a long time. Um, so, yeah, see, it takes actually a little bit longer than that. And that's because this is a uh, full gig of, um, of memory that was dumped out of the, uh, out of the system. Uh, so, anyway, you'll often find that you're running um, this image info command, uh, which will scan memory, and then it'll pull out a bunch of information that it identified about it. Um, so one of the things that it will pull out as well is suggestions for the profile. So the leftmost one um, ends up being the, you know, the, the higher percentage um, profile that you should use. And this is basically every version of Windows um, has slightly different data structure layout and different data structure arguments and stuff like that. Um, so what it does is it tries to do an exhaustive search to figure out what the best matches are, and it gave me these four options. So I just picked the leftmost one. What I'd recommend um, in the future, so you know, you're going to use this one as well because you have the same VM I do. But in the future, when you run this, you know, you start from the left and you try and see if your command works. And if it doesn't work, if it gives you an error because of um, saying some data structure doesn't exist or something's incompatible or it's unable to read something, then you just kind of work your way to the right, um, trying each one of them in sequence uh, until you find one that works or you run out of profiles to try and you determine that volatility just can't parse your particular build of Windows. So, um, And that's the big thing that we're trying to get out of here. There's a number of other things as well. Um, you can see, um, you know, there's some... Um, you know, different um, addresses for um, aspects of kernel memory, um, information about whether PAE is turned on, uh, stuff like that. Um, so we won't really touch many of these, but this was the big one that I wanted to show you, um, and that's how we got this profile choice up here. Um, so then what this is doing is it's, you know, running, um, you know, volatility. So if I wanted to, um, you know, if I wanted to, for instance, go and get, um, say, let me get this first. If I wanted to go and get, oh, say, the, um, you know, well, we'll just do this. We'll do help really quick. Um, so this lists all the different modules. Um, what I might want to do is pull, like, you know, command scan out or something like that, CMD scan, right? So then it'll run the CMD scan module, and it'll try and look through the memory dump to try and see if it can find uh, commands that were typed. Um, and so you can see here that it was able to find this CD and the host forensic tools, and then the win pmem uh, right here as well. So this is me running those commands. Um, there's some other ones that it thinks it found, but it doesn't know how to interpret them. Um, you can also tell that these two are at 0 and 1, and then it's got a large gap before... Um, going to these. So again, this thing is using a heuristic, trying to scan all of memory to try and see if it can identify something that's a command. Um, it may have identified something in each one of these spaces that seems like it could be a uh, command um, because it slightly matched the um, uh, the format of how Windows stores the hist history commands or the command history. Um, but then as you see here, it looks like there's a bunch of junk um, on printable characters. So this is where, when you're analyzing stuff, um, these tools aren't going to give you kind of, they're not an oracle that's giving you the answers. Um, they're giving you what it thinks the answers are, and then it's up to you to use your human brain um, to interpret the answers and try and figure out, okay, which of these make sense, and which of these are what amount to, say, false positive identifications by the tool. Um, so, and that's what's here. And you'll find that a lot of the forensic tools work this way. And the reason for this is because um, malware is often crafted in a way to try to evade identification, conceal itself, evade detection. Um, so a lot of the authors of these tools will be a lot more generous in reporting to you the things that they see um, and a lot less cautious, of, or I should say, um, uh, they'll be a lot more resistant to trying to hide things that look, that that the automated tool thinks are junk. Um, so that that's, you know, an example of that. Um, so 
let's look at the um, uh, the output of some of this. So um, there's a very useful tool called Timeliner.exe. Um, so what I'll do is I'll actually load up Timeliner.txt, um, and then we can go through it. So the nice thing about this is that initially it's carved up into the different um, uh, the different event types. So you can see all the IE histories are together, um, the live responses together. Um, this is kind of nice because it gives you a good timestamp of when um, kicking off this uh, action occurred. Um, so you can actually look at this and then try to you know use it as a partition from where you started messing around on the system as an analyst um, uh, to try and identify and delineate um, the time you were on the system and the time before you were on the system. Uh, so all the IE history is right next to each other. Um, I can page down a bit, um, and then all of a sudden I get to process, and I get to handle um, key, so handles. Um, and you can see that there's all of these different timestamps here at the beginning of the lines. Um, so oftentimes, uh, you know, what I might do, and um, I'll just kind of give some background here, um, these aren't reported into the file um, in the order that they occurred on the system. Uh, they're generally reported into this file according to the um, position of each one of these data points in memory. So it's scanning memory, and then it's just reporting them in here, and it's interpreting a timestamp where there is one. Um, so that's another key thing here is that um, this file contains all of the, or a lot of the data that some of the other modules can extract as well. Um, but it's limited down to the ones that have a timestamp associated with them for some uh, for some reason. So <clears throat> what I might want to do um, is use something like grep to look at all of the stuff that was in Timeliner um, in 2020, right? So I would look for anything that had 2020 at the beginning of the line, and then I'll get this. So one of the important things to keep in mind here is that some of these, um, like this one's 128, but then this one's 116, you know, 116. This one's 128 again, you know. It's kind of bouncing back and forth, right? Uh, so in Linux, I might end up using a sort tool as well. Um, I'll just say that um, there's no, you know, there's nothing wrong with um, using this approach. Um, or using a say spreadsheet and using column sorts to you know to do this with a spreadsheet. But um, I just happen to be a lot more familiar with doing this. Um, it also kind of gives a nice visual representation of the steps that I'm doing. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll take the output of that and then I'll sort it. Uh, this will do a numeric sort on the timestamps. So then I can see uh, when everything started happening on the machine you know, and uh, and so forth. Um, so I can see all the different activities that occurred. Um, I can go down to the bottom of it, and I can try and find that live response line. And so it's right here. Let me see. Yeah, see? So there's only one of them. So I can see there's this live response line here. Um, <clears throat> and it's right underneath some of this other stuff going on here. So, um, yeah, so... That kind of gives you an idea of, um, you know, that's the kind of timeline tool. And um, doing this timeline analysis is uh, very helpful for trying to gather a forensic idea of, say, what happened. You know, what was the sequence of steps that occurred on the machine? Because you might have one thing writes a file to disk, and then another action occurs that maybe writes something into the Windows registry or starts up a, pro uh, starts up a service in the system or something like that. Um, so looking in here... I can see that I have all of these, um, you know, file outputs. Um, there's a handful of them that are zero, and if uh, you run it and you get zero, uh, zero size files, that generally means that there's um, nothing in those files. Um, it's either an error occurred or there's nothing in those files because that um, doesn't exist on the system. Like in this case, I'm not using TrueCrypt on the VMs, so therefore there'd be no reason for these um, analyses to find anything. So. Um, you know, looking through here, I might also want to go into IE history, and this has some of the different, um, you know, 
sites and files that have been downloaded by Internet Explorer. Oops. So, so that's all here. Um, the file system directory. Um, again, this is a MFT to CSV tool. Uh, so if you want, you can install, say, LibreOffice or something like that inside of the Kali VM uh, if you want to open this up in there. Um, oftentimes I find that to be somewhat challenging to just work with a very kind of computationally intensive tool inside of the VM. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll actually um, run it. Um, it's going to dump, um, you know, the output path. It's going to dump its files into an output folder. Um, so this is a key uh, difference from, say, volatility and some of the other um, tools is um, I'm going to give MFT to CSV a folder. Um, what it will do is it will actually create a new folder um, that basically has MFT to CSV and then also the timestamp in the name. Uh, and then it will write um, maybe like 10 or 15 files in there. Um, so we can actually look at one of them right here. Um, because I have it, um, let me just get to the most recent one. So this one right here, um, I have it available. Um, so you can look at it here. Um, <clears throat> you know, so there's like 14, maybe 13 files, right, um, in here. So um, the biggest one is going to be this, or I should say, there's this really big CSV here. Um, then there's a handful of other things as well, right? Um so, for instance, it's got like the Slack entries and the reparse point object. You know, it's got all of these random things. Um, the main file, though, is this one. Um, this uh, basically MFT underscore and then long timestamp uh, with a year, month, day, hours, minutes, seconds dot CSV. Um, you'll also see a log file that's pretty sizable, and that's the log uh, from running the tool. So, if there are any errors or um, faults that it encountered, those will get reported there as well. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we'll actually open this up really quick, um, and uh, you'll be able to see um, what the what the content looks like. So again, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to open this up uh, in here uh, <clears throat> using LibreOffice. Um, you can use Microsoft Excel as well. Um, I just happen to be partial to LibreOffice um, from just a years of habit. Um, you know, open up the CSV file here. Um, the important thing um, also when you're opening up CSV files um, <clears throat> is that uh, <clears throat> this one has um, the pipe symbol or the bar, the one that's um, you know right on top of the uh, like Windows directory slash key on your keyboard, um, the one that's like near backspace or enter. Um, so the pipe character is used to separate. Uh, the columns. And that's so that the um, comma character um, or the tab character or some of the other common characters that are used for that um, can actually be used as part of the field as well. And the reason for that is just the pipe is a very uncommon character to see show up in any Microsoft Windows file name or Microsoft Windows um, event log or anything like that. Um, so they choose like the rarest character to use is the delimiter, um, which makes parsing a lot easier. Um, so you want to make sure that you configure that because it's most definitely not going to be your um, spreadsheet program's default choice uh, when you're importing a CSV. So then we'll go ahead and import it. And uh, this will take a little while. Um, this is another reason I use uh, so LibreOffice or numeric. Um, the document itself uh, can be pretty sizable, and therefore it might not, um, you know, it might run into some um, difficulty on some versions of Microsoft Excel trying to open anything that's that large. So while that's opening, um, and what you can see here is a uh, I actually have the copy of MFT to CSV, so that folder that I listed for you, um, a zip file that's also hosted as well. So for every single one of these, I provide you with the artifacts that came from my environment um, for you to use. So um, the registry data, so in Windows, I can actually take um, regedit.exe, uh, um, and I can actually use it to export a full um, text version of the Windows registry. And so here you go. This is the problem that I was talking about before. 
Um, so it's mad about the number of rows in this, um, you know, in this file. Um, so I might actually have to use a different spreadsheet because you can see that um, it's basically uh, has this uh, rows problem. So um, <clears throat> uh, there's other spreadsheet programs as well that you can use. Um, maybe we'll get back to the MFT later. Um, but uh, what I can do is I can actually just uh, oops. I can actually just uh, show you um, on the command line uh, kind of what this has. So this spreadsheet has uh, everything again carved up into a um, kind of a row that starts with a date and time, um, <clears throat> and then it has. The um, this MACB, which is the um, uh, which is basically the um, uh, the four different events um, that can be that the file system keeps track of timestamps for. Um, so, for instance, I can go here to NTFS MACB, and we can see if yeah. So. Um, this is Andrea Fortuna's blog. Um, I actually link this and a couple other things. Um, so this is a really good um, uh, this is a really good kind of documentation. Uh, so actually, I'll make sure that this uh, gets into the lecture notes as well. Um, basically, uh, Windows keeps track of these four timestamps. So when it was modified, when it was changed. So this is when the um, MFT, um, the master file table, or the metadata changed for the file, um, when it was accessed, so when it was last read, and then also when it was birthed or when it was created, right? So each one of these things documents um, uh, all of those timestamps. So you can read through that. Um, again, I'll make sure that it makes it into the lecture notes um, to get some more insight as to what these uh, what these mean. But um, what I can do is I can look for the 2020-0128 um, timestamps to try and show you, you know, what was going on more recently. And again, this is not sorted either. So this is stuff comes out uh, in the order that is found on disk. So what I might need to do is I might need to sort this before I, um, you know, before I run that. This is a very large file, so sorting it can take quite some quite a bit of time. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is that there are going to be some things in here. There's some files in here, some file records, I should say, in here where they were deleted. So this is how um, the files get deleted. Um, the directory entries get kind of recycled back to uh, be used for making new files. So, you know, I'll have this thing go and do the search. So, and then finally, um, the last thing we'll talk about is the uh, auto runs. I went into detail about those. Um, I'll actually open this up really quick. Um, this is kind of a listing of running auto runs um, on my system. So there's actually a large number of legitimate programs installed on here. Uh, so like uh, VM applet, um, and then also, uh, you know, let's see, VBox tray. So the virtual box tray application is running, uh, stuff like that. Um, you know, agent.pyw uh, uh, is running as well. Um, so, you know, this tool goes through and it finds all of the things that are designed to run when Windows boots up, um, which is a lot of things on a normal Windows system. Um, you want to use that to try and identify things that maybe um, maybe shouldn't be on it. So, and then finally, um, network connections. Um, so we're dealing with malware that is providing a backdoor command and control channel. Um, network connections will, um, you know, or I should say the ability to list the network connections that a system has um, will be what allows you to know, um, say, you know, identify um, what's, connect what's communicating with a um, with a rogue host, what's communicating with a bad IP address or something like that, or what's, you know, uh, even what ports are open and listening on my machine, uh, what TCP ports. Um, 
So we run nets, nets that with a set of arguments here, uh, which basically gives us a listing of all the network sockets. Um, it associates them to the process that owns them. So if a network socket, I can look at it and I can tell it's talking to a bad IP, it tells me what program's actually using that uh, and everything too. So you can see the copy that I put was right here. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so basically it lists, you know, here's the program. Here is, in this case, um, you know, the listening TCP socket. So it tells you what local address it's listening on and who it's allowing to communicate in, right? So you have a lot of that stuff. All right, <clears throat> so the next um, video, uh, we'll actually go into um, how we do this investigation, um, you know, how we do this investigation if, say, all the information we have um, is a bad IP address, a known bad IP address. So if we're told a known bad IP address, um, where do we start? And then where do we go from there to connect the dots? Because that's really what the analysis effort's about. You can see here the, um, you know, uh, the MFT um, sort and um, uh, grep process finished, uh, or I should say the, the searching and less finished. And you can see that there's all these files um, that were created on the system. Um, and here's the different timestamps that they were um, maybe not created. Sorry, all these file events that were created on the uh, on the MFT. Um, those are right here. And um, you can see the files they're associated with. Uh, so it gives you from the root path on. Um, it doesn't give you the C colon because the drive itself doesn't embed the drive letter and the files on it. Um, that way you can you know, plug the drive into another computer and it becomes drive E or drive F or something like that. Um, you don't want all of the files on the system to now be confused uh, with which drive that they live on. <clears throat> so that's why you see just a empty colon slash whatever. Um, but yeah, so we'll go and analyze this as well. Um, but yeah, um, for now, um, that's the end of the lecture. Thank you.